Hello guys and welcome back to s &E. Today we are talking about acute adaptations to resistance training. Alright guys, so let's jump straight into it. I don't want to waste any time today. Um, nice. One of the most fascinating adaptations uh, acute wise that we can see from resistance training is uh, this idea of protein turnover. Um, so basically how that's going to work is we're going to have an increased rate of muscle protein synthesis and also an increased rate in muscle protein breakdown. So you can see here by the two arrows that this rate of synthesis is a bit higher than the rate of breakdown. And that's important because breakdown is simply just breaking down old proteins and synthesis is like replacing it with newer, stronger, better proteins. Um, so I'll quickly explain this little joint. So inside blue here, we've got a muscle, can be any muscle, for example, the bicep, doesn't really matter. Uh, we've got blood vessel down here, and that's pretty much all that's to it. So basically what this is saying, right, is that from a bout of resistance training, we're gonna get an increased um, stimulus on the free amino acid pool, which is what these guys are gonna use to uh, break down and synthesize new muscle. And then what's gonna happen is from a good high protein diet, um, increased blood flow during and after exercise is gonna deliver more of these free amino acids via the blood to the pool within the muscle. And then the pool is readily used um, by any of these guys whenever they're required. So, boom. Okay guys, we're still talking about protein turnover. Now I'm gonna focus on the timing so I've got two graphs here, muscle protein synthesis and muscle protein breakdown. This one is like the same in terms of axis, by the way. I just, I didn't really feel like writing the axis down because like seeps. Um, but anyway, so we've got high and low. So this is the level of synthesis and this is the time frame. So before exercise, we've got a pretty low resting level of mo muscle protein synthesis. And then straight after, you know, within three hours, we get this massive surge of muscle protein synthesis. And then even up until 48 hours time, we've still got levels above resting, right? Um, and then the same is down here, except the time frame for this is maybe just before 48 hours. So this realistically probably goes on for a bit more than 48 hours, ever so slightly. Whereas this one is finishing just before 48 hours. So there's a slight difference in time frame there. Um, but some things I do want to highlight about this is that the study that I got this information from was from novices. So there could be a consideration there that uh, perhaps novices are getting better adaptations with this synthesis and breakdown rate in terms of time frame at least, uh, because we do know that novices get superior adaptations to those who are well trained. So that's something to consider. I would say that potentially the only implication of that is that this time frame might be a little bit less for a well-trained. Um, so I don't know, maybe perhaps like 36 hours. I'm not sure. Um, I haven't done a study on this myself, so I don't know. But I'm just saying that's something to consider. And also another thing, I haven't drawn it here, but in this study, the muscle protein breakdown rates were a little bit higher at rest than the synthesis. And that's because in this study they went into they went into their resistance training fasted, not eating any food. And I'm about to go into that right now. Okay, guys, here we go. This is the magic drawing that is going to sell you all on our uh, protein turnover. Okay. Um, so up here we've got fasted training, and down here we've got fed training. Um, and by the way, being fed for your training uh, in the case of muscle growth relies on. Uh, amino acids, so basically high quality protein, uh, any of your meats or even um, what are those, the, the shakers, protein protein powder with uh, amino acids, high levels of amino acids. Um, so yeah, being fed for the case of resistance training relies on protein and that can be either before or after training, by the way. Um, so in faster training, you can see down here a little legend I've drawn. Uh, blue is the synthesis and red is the breakdown. So basically, if you go into a training fasted and you don't even eat after training either, um, your muscle protein breakdown is always going to be higher 
than your synthesis rate. Whereas if you have fed training, whether that's before, during or after, you're gonna get a huge surge in synthesis compared to breakdown. And obviously this is good because you wanna be laying down new muscle. If you just have a higher breakdown rate all the time, um, you're obviously gonna be taking your muscle apart without enough stimulus to build it back up. So your muscle size could actually shrink. Um, so yeah, by the way, uh, this effect, this protein turnover effect still isn't fully known. Like um, a great example of is um, when you do endurance training, right? When you go for a long run, you're gonna get this same protein turnover effect, right? Um, but the thing is, we know from endurance training, we're not gonna get any superior strength gains, right? So that means there's some sort of process going on within this protein turnover that decides whether or not a muscle is actually gonna grow in size for strength or just grow and repair, if that makes sense. Because we think about the difference between resistance training and endurance training. We know our legs are gonna be sore the next day after we do a big run, but we're not, they're not gonna grow in size if we consistently do that. Whereas if we do a massive leg session every week, eventually the size of your legs are gonna start growing. So this is not fully understood, but I just wanted to showcase the importance of making sure that you are feeding yourself uh, before, during, or after training. And remember this effect can last up to 30, 48 hours, right? So there's a lot of people out there who think there's a magic number per se. Uh, for example, uh, who knows, uh, might be your personal trainer who's done six months of uh, Cert 3 and thinks he knows everything and says, Oh, by the way, as soon as you get home, you know, you, you got to have your protein shake within 30 minutes, okay? Otherwise, the session will be worth nothing. Well, the evidence actually suggests that if you wanted to, you could wait 24 hours um, and your rate of synthesis is still going to be high. Um, obviously, wouldn't recommend the 24 hours. But my point being, if you live a busy lifestyle, you can afford to miss three hours without eating any food, even more. So don't listen to your personal trainer. Uh, because most of the time, he doesn't know what he's talking about. Okay guys, uh, now we've got some more drawings for you. Uh, this acute response to training is going to be, uh, I guess, your delayed onset muscle soreness. Um, so up here we've got a nice little pretty drawing of pre-training. Uh, you can see we've got, uh, we've got our myofibrils, uh, our Z lines in blue, and then the little X's showcase uh, little sarcomeres. Um, Unfortunately, for the sake of this video, I couldn't actually, uh, you know, cut into someone's leg and get a good photo for you. Uh, but I've drawn which should be just as good. Um, so as you can see, things over here are pretty nice. They're pretty, you know, I don't, I don't know. They look, they look the way they're supposed to. I guess they look nice and in line and everything. But then we do a hundred eccentric reps of squats. You know, really focusing on the eccentric phase because um, that's when you're going to damage your muscle the most. And look, suddenly, everything looks a bit funky. I've even drawn little question marks in here to go, is that is that a sarcomere? Is that is that a sarcomere? Um, so, you know, our uh, Z lines are quite messed up all over the place. Uh, same with our myofibrils. They're a bit dodgy. Um, so, yeah, that, that's showcasing kind of what has a look inside the muscle. Okay, now down here, we're gonna go into a bit more depth, I guess. Uh, so this red little circle, we've got the muscle fiber membrane, uh, and this is a blood vessel. So what's gonna happen is when you perform heavy resistance training, we're gonna get damage to the sarcolemma, right? And the sarcolemma is pretty important for managing whether or not substances come in and out. So you could imagine with the damage to the sarcolemma, we're gonna get some leakages in and out. All right, so what this damage might look like, I don't know, we might get some like little spots here rubbed out um, where these bad boys can come in and these bad boys can come out, All right? So first we're gonna talk about myoglobin. By the way, these things leak into the bloodstream um, in accordance to their concentration gradient. Um, so myoglobin can leak into the bloodstream. I guess that's fine or whatever. But if we have too much muscle damage and we get too much myoglobin in the bloodstream, it can make its way down to the kidneys and this could lead to some pretty uh, actual devastating um, circumstances. Like we could get some pretty bad uh, renal failure 
Um, but that's not something that happens often at all. That's only something you could probably do if you were hadn't really done a resistance training session in ages and you decided to do two hours of max failure eccentric squats or something like that, for example. Like this damage you'd get, you'd have to be going pretty crazy in your session, like really crazy to get that sort of damage. Anyway, that's a bit off topic. But then we also get this CK here, creatine kinase, leaks into the bloodstream as well. And we can actually do uh, blood measures and simple tests to detect the level of blood damage by looking at the level of creatine kinase, which is quite exciting. And a little fun fact to you, that's actually sometimes how they can detect uh, whether or not someone is going to or has had a heart attack uh, because obviously the heart's a muscle as well. Heart has creatine kinase in it. And when there's a damaged hole in the heart, uh, we're actually gonna get some creatine kinase leak out into the bloodstream as well. So there's a cool one for you. Okay, now we're gonna talk about calcium, the stuff that comes in, I guess. So calcium comes in. Calcium can be a bit of a pain, or I don't know. Calcium comes in, well, I, I don't know. It's, it's a bit controversial. So calcium comes in and it can activate an enzyme called calpin, right? And this calpin enzyme is actually going to be responsible for breaking down tissue even further um, and causing even more damage. But obviously this is also going to help repair the tissue. So that's uh, kind of where it's a bit controversial. Um, and we're also going to get white blood cells come in. They're going to try and help us repair uh, the fiber, the membrane as well however they are i guess indiscriminate indiscriminate because what tends to happen with white blood cells is they end up causing inflammation um, and that is obviously going to lead to even more pain and soreness so these guys who knows what they're doing in there they're, they're, they're coming in they're trying to help but uh they're kind of causing us a bit more discomfort but i guess they're doing their job and and we're eventually repairing the muscles so Go them, I guess. And another important thing to note is that in this process, lactate is not involved at all. I know there's a thing about like, oh, lactate, you know, lactate, like, it, oh, it feels, it burns the lactate. Well, the thing is, lactate is gone back down to resting slash normal levels within like 20 to 30 minutes after you finish training. Um, so this stuff is purely past that point. So there's no lactate involved in this. Um, so in this whole delayed onset soreness you feel uh there's no no contribution to lack from lactate to that pain and discomfort so you can purely if you're going to blame anyone i'd recommend you blame these two bad boys here because they're they're the real reason all right oh also i apologize i just realized that um i've left the title for protein turnover up here when i was talking about this stuff so please um please disregard the title that was a bit inconsiderate of me and don't worry i'll fix the title right now Okay guys, we're gonna very briefly talk about blood pressure responses. Um, because I guess, yeah, it's an acute adaptation to resistance training, like it's happening during. Um, but it also might be important for you to understand perhaps. Um, so I'm just gonna talk about a few things that influence the blood pressure response and how you can minimize that, I guess. So the first thing of course being uh, the amount of reps you do. So regardless of the weight you lift, so you could lift bloody 10 kilos on like a squat, for example, or you could lift like 200 kilos on a squat. And the, regardless of the weight you lift, the closer you get to failure, the higher your blood pressure is going to get, right? So there might be, I don't know if you've ever heard this going around, but like some people might say, oh, oh, oh you're worried about your blood pressure? Oh, it's fine. Just lift light weights um, to failure and you'll be fine. You, you just don't lift heavy weights. Well, if you listen to that person, you're an idiot because you're still going to get really high blood pressure. Um, so I guess in terms of this, in my eyes, the easiest way to potentially avoid a high blood pressure response without sacrificing too much of your training would be, you know, maybe just to get rid of these last two reps. And then suddenly, you know, you're only here instead of up here. And that's great. Um, other things that influence blood pressure response is the amount of muscle mass recruited. So, for example, if you were doing a squat, that's a large amount of um, body muscle mass. So you might get some, or you will, you will get some quad activation. So you'll be getting some blood pressure down there. 
You might even get a little bit of like hamstring antagonist activity. It's not a prime mover of the squat, okay? Uh, squats do not work your hamstrings, but I'm not sure they might get it, have a bit of um, antagonistic effect because um, it, it's an antagonistic antagonist of the quad. Uh, you get some blood pressure response in your glutes, which is one of the biggest muscles in your whole body. Uh, you might get some, you know, in your abdominals, uh, in your erector spinae, maybe even some like up around your shoulder, perhaps. Like there's a lot of muscle mass recruited for that. So you're going to get a lot of biceps, uh, sorry, a lot of blood pressure. Whereas if you just did a single arm bicep curl, you've literally got the tiniest amount of muscle mass here. So you're going to get a much less blood pressure response. And that leads me on to my next point about unilateral exercises. Uh, so that's going to basically cut the amount of muscle mass involved in half. So if you're still wanting to train your legs, for example, you could do a single leg leg press. That's going to reduce the amount of uh, blood pressure response. Or you can do eccentrically biased exercise. So uh, that would mean, you know, lift a weight down with... Um, so lift a weight down with one leg because we know we're stronger eccentrically and then push that same weight up with two legs because then you're still going to get um, some good concentric effects because it's going to be heavier in the concentric phase. Um, some other things we could talk about is um, I know in my other videos I was talking about cluster sets not being effective. Well, in the case of blood pressure, right, these cluster sets could actually be pretty good for you because... Um, if we think about this response here, right, what's going to happen is if it's immediate, it's going to be like this, right? But if we go one rep and then have a break, it might actually get back down to resting level. So then when we do our next rep, it's going to go to the same level or maybe like a tiny bit further. And then we wait again and then boom, same again. So you're actually going to get a much lower blood pressure response compared to if you're doing reps after reps after reps, you're going to get... Massive, <laughs> massive blood pressure responses. So I guess there you have it, guys. I hope you enjoyed, and I hope you learned something. Um, geez, the channel has actually been going so well so far, and I'm so proud of the very little steps we've come so far, but at the same time, massive. We're up to over 100 subscribers now. That's crazy. I started this maybe a month ago at, like, 70 subs. Um, so I'm so happy with that. Videos are getting hundreds of views as well. Um, it's just so stoked like I'm trying to provide best scientific quality of evidence here um, And I'm just so glad that people are actually finding my content worthwhile um, So follow me through this journey continue because the quality is just gonna get better um, You know one day I'm planning on getting like a microphone for my shirt uh, getting a better room to film this in some new white pens and stuff and yeah, there's just so much I want to do. Like, I want to um, go over, like, study materials. Um, I, I've got this cool video idea coming up where I, I want to um, compare the velocity and acceleration of, like, NRL players scoring, like, a full field intercept try versus um, a video clip of me scoring an intercept try just recently. Um, like, there's so many things I want to do. Maybe um, I'm doing an assignment in the coming weeks on a biomechanical analysis of like a cricket fastball. So I'd love to share my knowledge on that and maybe even like uh, do a biomechanical na analysis on like uh, Pat Cummins, for example, or maybe even Jasper Boomer because he's a bit he's a bit different compared to the rest. But just so passionate at the moment and the, the way that you guys have been reacting recently just gives me even more motivation to keep going and make my quality even better. So I hope you enjoyed today's video. I thought it was actually really nicely done. Um, and I thought I taught it pretty well. So let me know what you think, and I'll see you guys in the next one. I'm looking forward to it. Thank you. Bye.